Hi everyone, this is Ryan Crodel again at Valencell. Uh, thank you for joining us here this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are in the world. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us here today. Uh, as you can tell, I am not Dr. Jesse Tucker, uh, who was uh, intended to be the, the speaker here today. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Tucker had a, a conflict that came up last minute that um, prevented him from uh, doing the webinar today. So I'm standing in, and uh, but we'll uh, we'll go through the same content, and um, hopefully this will uh, be valuable for you in uh, understanding the the systems approach to wearable biometrics. Uh, Valencell is a strong proponent of the the notion that uh, the the different systems within a uh, wearable biometric sensor need to be designed to work together preferably by the, the same organization that um, has access to um, resources working together on that biometric sensor system that uh, it can ensure that the hardware is designed to work with the software and the testing and the validation uh, that goes into these products both at the, at the core technology level as well as the, the implementation level and uh, in, into a wearable device is all done uh, with a single strategy in mind and uh, is designed to, to work together. So um, you can think of this similar to the, the analogy I like to use is, the, um, is one of a, uh, of a car where um, it, using different components of a, um, a wearable sensor system for measuring heart rate and other biometrics is similar to, to trying to, to use a, a Ford motor and um, uh, a Chevy chassis and a Tesla drivetrain. Put all those things together and it probably will look like a car, but it's not going to perform very well. Um, that, that same notion, same, uh, same thing applies to uh, the biometric sensor systems that we see in, um, in the market today for wearable devices. So, um, with that, I, I, um, w before I jump in, I, I should cover a few quick uh, uh, housekeeping items. If you do have questions throughout the, the course of the presentation, I, I'd like to keep these as interactive as, as possible to the extent we can in a webinar format. So if you have questions, please do submit them through, through the webinar interface, and I'll take those as they come up. If you, want, uh, if you have a specific question about a, a, a particular topic or if you want me to dive deeper in any particular area, I'm happy to do so as we go along. We've also got um, uh, Q&A time built into the end of the presentation as well if, uh, if you'd rather wait as well. So we can do that. Um, also, one of, the, uh, one of the questions we always get is will the, the slides and the recording uh, of this webinar be made available? And the answer is yes. We will get those out to all of you who attended uh, so you can share this with any of your colleagues or anyone who you think might be interested uh, but may not have been able to join today. So, so with that, <clears throat> pardon me, I will, um, I'll jump right in and um, so looking at uh, the different components of this uh, systems approach to uh, wearable biometric sensor systems. So, Along the, the bottom here, you see the, the physical layer, and that includes both the, the physical layer in terms of the human body, because by, by default, these devices need to interact with the human body. So there are certain aspects of human physio physiology and um, the, uh, uh, how optics interact with human tissue and the human body, and obviously there's there's optical uh, considerations here, given that this is optical technology. We're talking about it that uses the photoplethysmography to shine light into the body and measure how much of that light is reflected back based on blood flow. So there's some basic um, uh, physiology and basic uh, physical understanding uh, of the, the physics involved here that, that are required. Uh, but then also there's, of course, the the, um, the nature of the hardware that goes into this, the, 
the sensors, the, op, uh, the analog front end, and the, the mechanical design that goes into the, the hardware layer of these devices. Uh, next up is the, the software layer, of course, starting with the firmware that, that manages that, um, the, the process of um, uh, turning that analog signal into, uh, into a digital signal and then feeding that into algorithms that process the data into meaningful data points like heart rate, uh, like cardiac efficiency, like blood pressure, like uh, VO2 and VO2 max, other, um, uh, other, out, um, other outputs of uh, these devices as well. And the next layer up, of course, is then what, what do you do with that data? How do you turn that into a meaningful user experience? And um, most of that has to do with um, assessments of the outputs of the algorithm. So what can you do with heart rate? As an example, you can do things like um, uh, heart rate response, heart rate recovery, resting heart rate, active heart rate, max heart rate. There's a, and that, that's just the, more of the, the direct derivatives of, of heart rate. There's a variety of other things you can do with uh, things like the RR interval or the time between beats of the heart. You can turn that into heart rate variability, which has aspects uh, or has meaning across different um, assessments of fitness levels, but then also uh, assessments of certain health conditions as well. And then, of course, how do you put that into a user interface? that is meaningful to the user of that device, whether that's in uh, the face of a smartwatch or if that's fed into a mobile application or perhaps it's, in the case of a medical device, fed into um, an electronic health record of some kind. What is that end-to-end -end user experience and how does, how does the core technology here uh, and the data that that technology is producing um, get put into a user interface that, that has meaning to uh, the user of that information in context and uh, in a way that, that uh, helps them achieve whatever they're trying to achieve. And then, of course, there's the, the production level of it's, it's certainly one thing to make, make a device work on, uh, on a bench or in a lab. It's an entirely different, um, uh, different set of challenges to make that device work at scale to where you're producing um, hundreds of thousands or millions of these devices uh, at scale and making sure that all of those devices work in the, the, at the same level of uh, same level of accuracy and same uh, compelling user experience as you see in um, in perhaps the lab or on the bench and then um, one of the, the other aspects that really um, uh, uh, goes along all uh, aspects or all layers of this systems approach is the intellectual property that goes along with um, the, the, each one of these layers, and we'll talk about what that landscape looks like uh, more uh, as we go along here. But um, that, um, that at, at, in a, at a very high level is what this, um, when we say the systems approach to uh, biometric sensor system, this is um, at a high level the, the different components of that system that all fit together in um, ultimately bringing um, highly accurate biometric sensor systems and sensor data into uh, wearable devices that can uh, drive compelling user experiences at scale. And so we'll dive into each one of these uh, components in, uh, in a little more detail as we go along. But um, as, a, uh, as a quick reminder, if you do have any questions as I go along, please do submit that through, uh, through the um, uh, webinar interface, the ReadyTalk interface. So we'll, we'll start off with the, uh, coming back to the, the bottom layer here and, and move our way up as we, uh, as we go here starting with the, the, um, the physical layer of the, the, the human physiology and the optics that go into uh, these devices. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, by, by their very nature, these devices, uh, unlike a lot of other technologies, even other wearable technologies, need to physically interact with the human body. They need to shine light into uh, the body and measure how much of that light is reflected back based on blood flow. And this is, a, again, a very high-level depiction of a uh, PPG sensor system or photoplethysmography 
sensor system that are common in uh, a variety of different wearables out there on the market today. You have optical emitters and the, um, the optics and the lensing that go on top of those emitters that, that shine light into, into the body and then um, uh, an optical detector, typically a photodiode, and of course the optics that go on top of that um, in terms of the lensing that, uh, that capture the reflected light and unfortunately a variety of other light um, into that detector along with uh, a, a motion sensor, typically uh, an accelerometer, given that these uh, sensor systems are uh, are by nature moving around because humans move around uh, in, in parts of their daily activities. Um, we, uh, the, it, most of these systems today uh, typically use an accelerometer to characterize uh, that motion data that's also coming into the sensor. So um, at, a, at the core though, you, um, you need to understand the, the human physiology, particularly in different body locations because these sensor systems are put into, um, uh, into different devices that are worn in different locations on the body. You need to understand the, the different elements of human physiology in those different locations. The, the most typical example is um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of people put these into devices that people wear on their wrist, whether that's a smartwatch or a fitness band or uh, even more of a, of a fashion watch or some, some kind of device like that. Um, uh, that's, uh, the physiology of the wrist is very different from, say, the, the physiology of the human ear, where a, a lot of these uh, sensor systems are also being uh, integrated into audio earbuds of all kinds, whether that's wired, wireless, or even now true wireless earbuds that uh, are literally just, just the earbuds themselves. The human physiology of the ear uh, is such that it's primarily just cartilage and blood vessels, and um, you also don't have a whole lot of local motion, meaning even when your body's in motion or even when your head is in motion, the, the ear itself is relatively stable, typically. Uh, you compare that to the wrist where there's bone, there's muscle, there's tendon, there's a variety of different uh, physiological components in, um, in that area of the body. And there's also uh, tends to be a lot of local motion. You um, uh, move around and move your arms and hands a lot more than your uh, head and ear moves, as an example. So um, there's a lot more, uh, a lot more noise. Uh, a lot, it's a lot more difficult to get an accurate measurement of biometrics at the wrist than it is at a place like the ear or uh, other places on the head, for that matter, the, fore, the forehead and the, the temple are also uh, very good locations to, uh, to measure biometrics optically. But there's other components here, other aspects here from a physiological standpoint. Uh, there's different, um, different fitness levels, different BMI counts. There's different skin tones, obviously. Different uh, skin tones absorb light in different ways. Higher melanin counts, darker skin tones tend to absorb the green light more than, um, than uh, lower melanin counts or lighter skin tones. And so that's why you see um, a lot of these sensor systems using different wavelengths of light in, in order to counteract some of that, um, again, the physics of, of light absorption when, uh, when light interacts with the, with the human skin. Uh, this is also, um, particularly important when uh, you um, when you think about how the body is moving um, uh, by default these devices are moving quite a bit but that the the nature and the dynamics of that motion is very different and causes different changes in how the the sensor system is detecting light just to give you a, um, a high level example here when um, the body is in relatively periodic motion, something like running or jogging, um, where the arm is, is swinging back and forth at a, at a fairly regular cadence and pace and, um, and, and movement flow, that's, uh, that presents uh, very differently in, uh, from, a, from a data standpoint in the photo detector than uh, what we call non-periodic motion. So things like um, CrossFit or gym activities or uh, something like a, a, an obstacle course race or something along those lines. And all of those things are very different from 
uh, let's say when someone is is uh, sitting still or is in uh, is is relatively motionless, that that changes how all of that data is coming into uh, into the photo detector and therefore how um, how it's processed by uh, by the sensor system. So uh, that then. Um, feeds right into the mechanical design, still at this physical or hardware layer, feeds right into the, the mechanical design and particularly the, the sensors and the, the um, analog front end that, that goes into these devices. And I'll talk about a few, um, a few things that need to be considered here, again, as part of this, this systems approach, one of which is um, simply the spacing between the emitter and the detector in these devices. Obviously. Um, everyone wants these devices and these sensor systems to be as small as possible to make room for um, other components in the device. And by, again, by, by their very nature with wearable devices, we're talking with about a very limited amount of, uh, of real estate to work with in the device, particularly when you're talking about audio earbuds. And so it's um, the, the smaller the better from a user experience and a comfort standpoint, but it's, it's not always smaller the better for, uh, for the accuracy of the, the measurement of uh, the biometric sensor system. So um, in, um, uh, just to kind of summarize that spacing uh, question here, the wider spacing certainly captures uh, less total light, which you, you would think would be a bad thing, uh, but actually it, um, it allows you to capture a higher ratio of uh, light that is actually reflected off of blood flow, as opposed to um, as you get the detector closer to the emitter, one thing is you, you can get um, uh, crosstalk between the two where the emitter is feeding light directly into the detector and it's either going directly into the detector or barely bouncing off the skin and not actually penetrating the skin uh, to get down to the capillary beds where you can actually see, uh, see blood flow and, and get meaningful data out of there. So you get more, um, uh, more what we call bad light here, if you will, motion-related scatter or uh, direct crosstalk between, uh, between the emitter and the detector. And that's just one aspect of the, the mechanical design. Some other uh, considerations, simply the geometry of the um, spacing, not just the spacing, but also the, the, the placement of the emitters and the detectors. Most of these devices, uh, certainly the, the more accurate ones on the market, have more than one emitter to get different angles of light uh, into that detector to be able to uh, interrogate the blood flow from different angles, from different um, light sources. To, to be able to uh, get a better uh, understanding of what is noise versus what is actual signal there. And the geometry of the, the placement of the emitters, uh, the, the two or three, however many emitters uh, beyond just the, the one you have, uh, the geometry of those compared to where the detector sits uh, has a significant influence on how, the, um, how accurate these devices can be uh, particularly during motion and, and high intensity activities. Light guiding is another, is another critical piece. How does, uh, the, the emitters can't just scatter light in, um, in a broad range uh, towards the body. Uh, they work best when that, those uh, emitters are guiding light into a specific point in, um, uh, in the body that uh, can reflect best back into the detector. Again, it's a way of reducing uh, the amount of bad light and um, increasing the, the amount of good light in, um, that's coming into the detector. I mentioned different wavelengths. Uh, part of that is to, um, uh, to mitigate some of the, the skin tone uh, differences that we talked about earlier, but also different wavelengths penetrate the, the human body in different, um, at different levels, so you'll get as an example, um, uh, deeper penetration with red and infrared than you will with uh, green and yellow, but uh, in, in many cases the, the deeper penetration doesn't necessarily ever make it, um, make it back out to the detector where you need it to be, so there's, there's other um, factors and considerations there in terms of wavelengths. Another, uh, another way um, uh, wavelengths are used is 
uh, just back to the ear versus wrist example, um, most of the, the devices today use visible light on the wrist because the, the wrist-based devices can provide enough of a shadow to, um, to keep out a, a, the environmental light to where the detector is not uh, overrun with, uh, with uh, sunlight or uh, fluorescent light or whatever it might be. At the ear, that's far more difficult to do, particularly when you go outside in sunlight with, uh, with an earbud, the um, uh, sunlight tends to wash out any of the emitter light um, uh, through the back of the ear, and it makes it very difficult to do that with any level of accuracy with visible light. Um, so infrared is often used at the, um, at the ear location to be able to mitigate that, um, that issue around visible light. Um, the, in the interest of time here, I won't go deep into the rest of these four here, but needless to say, the, the configuration of the AFE um, and uh, the register settings and so forth uh, associated with that are uh, a critical component to how the, the, the device performs. Uh, electrical noise, we see this uh, real, as a very common issue um, that, again, at the system level, we, we have seen um, uh, electrical noise uh, corrupting um, the, um, uh, the data collection at the detector level to, to be able to uh, get as clean of a signal as possible. So you've got to be careful with how the, uh, how the electronics are configured on the board uh, as it relates to the, the sensor configuration. And coupling and gross displacement, this has more to do with the, the overall form factor of as to how the, the sensor module itself is coupled with the skin, and then uh, gross displacement of, particularly during motion, how much does that sensor actually move across the skin? Again, um, uh, the more motion, uh, the, the more challenging in terms of how, uh, in terms of getting an accurate signal and therefore accurate outputs uh, from these devices. All of those things, and there, there are many others that, um, that uh, require consideration there, but these are just the most common ones we see in um, the, the mechanical design and, and certainly the, the front end of, of these devices. But then, of course, that signal comes into um, the, the front end here. Uh, with, uh, that we've been talking so far about the, the, the hardware and the sensor module aspect of things, but then that, that sensor data gets fed into an algorithm uh, with, uh, of course, firmware that manages this whole process of not just the hardware aspect of things, but then taking the output of the, the sensors themselves, the raw data feed from the sensors, and, um, and doing that analog to digital confer conversion and feeding that through to the, the algorithms that are actually taking that raw data and turning that into uh, heart rate and other biometrics. So, um, we'll get into to the, the um, key metrics in, in, uh, in more detail in a moment, but uh, from a signal processing standpoint, we found that, that, uh, something, that something called active signal characterization is, is key here in terms of being able to not just throw out all of the motion noise, but actually characterize what is motion noise, what is uh, environmental light, what is um, uh, what is um, the skin motion versus the body motion, being able to identify what are all of those things, characterize that data in a way that feeds only the most relevant information into the, um, the metric conversion algorithms. And it, it's, it's a situation where you, you can't necessarily just uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. You need to understand what are all of those signals coming in and what is most useful for the application that, um, that uh, you're trying to, and ultimately the end user experience that you're trying to uh, support in the device. So for example, a sports and fitness use case, the motion noise can be uh, useful in identifying whether a person is running or swimming or biking or doing some other act kind of activity that can help, um, uh, can help make for more accurate biometric um, uh, outputs in terms of the, the key metrics that are identified there. But from a system level standpoint, if you think about if you, um, if you use different 
hardware, different sensor systems, let's say a different AFE, um, if you have to reconfigure all that, the, the firmware and the algorithms for every one of that, um, every one of those hardware changes or hardware differences, it's an entirely new trial and error process to uh, understand how well that works, what are the, what are the, the issues with the, the data coming off of those sensor systems. And needless to say, we do a tremendous amount of testing and, and R&D around the different uh, analog front ends, the different LEDs, the different um, components of, of these systems to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And um, at the end of the day, if you're building a wearable device, that's not necessarily the, the best use of your time in, in uh, doing R&D and doing testing around a bunch of different uh, analog front ends is, is probably not the best use of your time. Um, but the same thing uh, applies from an algorithm standpoint as well is, uh, are, is the, the algorithm or algorithms you're using flexible enough to support a, a wide variety of um, activities and use cases that um, the device may be used for. You can see this today with there's, there's quite a bit of overlap going on in the consumer, what have been more sports and fitness wearables and what are considered more health and medical devices. Um, those algorithms need to be able to support a, um, someone who is running or doing CrossFit or biking or whatever it might be, but then also be able to support um, accurate biometric measurement in, uh, while they're typing at their computer or while they're driving their car or whatever it might be. Um, it's, um, it's much more beneficial to be able to apply a single algorithm that can handle all of those different use cases as opposed to having to switch modes or switch algorithms depending on, uh, depending on the use case. Um, it is also a situation where it, it's, it's very much a, a garbage in, garbage out scenario with, with any analytics or any algorithms uh, that the uh, the cleaner the signal coming into those algorithms, uh, the better your output is going to be. It's very much a garbage in, garbage out scenario where if you've got a noisy signal coming in, you're um, uh, likely to get poor outputs on the, on the other end. Another aspect here that um, is uh, a, a customer expectation or a market expectation these days is firmware uh, upgradability over the air. So, um, can you make ongoing enhancements to the, the firmware and the algorithms that are, uh, that are doing the outputs here on an ongoing basis over the air so um, someone can, uh, a user of the device can get uh, continually um, and enhanced capabilities and enhanced user experiences over the course of time. Just a few considerations there from a, from a firmware and an algorithm standpoint. Um, next, we'll move up into the testing layer. Um, first, with user testing, uh, this is um, uh, all too often, it's getting better certainly, but it's, it's too often um, ignored or misapplied in, in terms of the, the amount of and the type of user testing that is being done on these devices. Again, the, it, it sounds fairly obvious, but the, the, the testing that is done during the product development process needs to match the intended user experience. So if someone is, if it's a triathlon focused watch, it needs to be tested in swimming, biking, and running. Um, there, that's, uh, again, it sounds very obvious, but it uh, all too often doesn't, uh, doesn't happen that way. Um, but the same thing applies for um, if you are gonna use the device to track sleep, how well does that uh, device perform? Is it actually tracking sleep or is it just tracking movement? Uh, throughout the night that may or may not be correlated to sleep. Um, same thing with more uh, personal health oriented applications. Is it actually measuring what it, um, what it says it measures and, it, and can, it, can it do that across a wide spectrum of the population? So um, the testing needs to be both broad and deep. So um, testing protocols that match the use cases obviously but um, what we've found is that we need to test at least 30 different people, multiple physical habitus, um, uh, different genders, different skin tones, different fitness levels, whatever it might be, um, that, and that's per prototype variant. So anything that changes, whether hardware or software related on a prototype throughout the 
product development process needs to be tested um, on, um, on that many people, and that obviously results in uh, hundreds of data sets per product launch, but you should see continual improvement in the testing uh, of those different prototype variants, or at least understand why you're not seeing improvement in those different prototypes as you tweak, whether uh, tweak the hardware, or tweak the software, or different components. Um, obviously, the, the analytics that go into this um, they include things like regression analysis and bland Altman analysis to, to understand how this, um, across all of those different variants and across those different data sets, what's working, what's not working, and how you can make progress. Again, this is the, you can see pretty clearly if you're working with a different company for your hardware and your software and your testing and validation of the device, the, the more parties involved, the, the more challenging it gets, and frankly, the more uh, finger pointing you tend to get with, um, with what's going on in the, the testing process and the performance of the device. Um, analytics can and, and certainly should include um, uh, true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, and the total therein. And so um, uh, understanding when something is working at the appropriate time in the appropriate context is, uh, is critical there. And preferably, um, the, the technology involved uh, would have in independent validation of the, the metrics that um, you're trying to measure. So independent validation of, of heart rate and RR interval and other, uh, other biometrics along those lines are, um, uh, it, it's rare, but it is out there. So next, looking at the user experience, uh, um, we like to say starting with the end in mind in terms of the, the user experience. And actually, uh, you can think about this from the, from the entire product development cycle. Uh, it is always best to start with the end in mind. Again, that sounds uh, fairly obvious, but it's, um, it, it's not as common as, as one might hope. But those use cases and those user experiences vary, obviously, across different, um, across different industries, across different form factors, and um, across different measurements that the, the device is intended to measure. So building a, um, a triathlon watch is very different, obviously, than building a VR headset that is uh, targeted towards medical applications. It's, um, those, uh, those user experiences are critical, and really starting with the end in mind, um, uh, looking at what outputs do you need in order to support that user experience with enough accuracy across a broad spectrum of the population, or at least your, in, your target population, that, um, that drives a meaningful user experience that people can believe in, um, or in some cases, uh, regulatory bodies can believe in. Um, so working back from there, um, the, or, or working off of the, the key metrics, the key outputs from the, the biometric sensor system, those then feed assessments. So for example, off of, uh, with continuous heart rate, you can, I think I mentioned earlier, you can get resting heart rate, heart rate recovery, heart rate response. With VO2, you can get VO2 max. With RR interval, you can get heart rate variability, on and on here as the, the different uh, core metrics then feed different assessments, with, which then feed the, the user experience that, uh, that you're trying to, to, um, uh, trying to support for uh, your customers. But ultimately, what are your customers or what are your users trying to accomplish, and how does your device help them do that? Work backwards from there to the, um, the, the assessments you need in order to support that user experience, the key metrics required for those assessments, and then, of course, the the sensor systems that can produce those metrics. So next we'll move up into the, the um, production or scalability layer. And um, for those of you who've seen a few of our webinars, or at least the one where we talked about our, our lessons learned in, um, uh, in building biometric wearable uh, sensor systems, this will be a bit of a repeat, so I apologize if you've seen this before. But it's worth uh, repeating because the, the um, the question of who is going to manufacture the device at scale is, is a critical one. And um, what we found is that there are obviously a, a bunch of different contract manufacturers out there. 
uh, but have they built a biometric wearable before? The, the adding the optical components to a device like this is, um, is challenging, uh, to say the least, and is not uh, the core competency of many of the contract manufacturers out there. In fact, at Valencell, we've we had to establish a certification process and methodology for our uh, contract manufacturers that our, our customers work with um, to ensure that the the biometric sensor systems, as they're getting uh, integrated and, and um, manufactured at scale within the devices, uh, see the same level of performance that we see uh, here in our labs and in our testing process. And in fact, we've gone so far as to build a, a proprietary test jig to uh, test all of the devices that are coming off the line in an automated way to be able to ensure that level of quality. Um, Another aspect we see uh, big challenges in um, really every device um, these days is, is incorporating Bluetooth in, in some way. Um, and it's one of the more challenging aspects of, uh, of building a device at scale that works. And <clears throat> so has your contract manufacturer built a, a Bluetooth wearable before is, uh, is another big question to ask. How do they test those devices coming off the line, not just for the, the biometrics, although that's a, that's a critical piece of it, but how do they test the devices um, as a whole coming off of the line? And then, of course, what are, their, what are the working conditions in that environment? What are the labor policies? How do they, how do they build these devices at scale in a way that, um, uh, that is uh, aligned with uh, your corporate policies and your um, corporate values? Is, is um, uh, an important aspect of, of the contract manufacturing process as well. So um, I just realized I haven't um, uh, I haven't looked at the questions in a while, and I, I realized I just got a, a or it was um, a few slides back. I think we got a question about um, the uh, the uh, um, uh, AFE terminology, and apologies, I should have spelled that out. Uh, AFE stands for analog front end. It's the, the, the part of these devices that um, uh, convert the, the um, analog signal into um, uh, digital data uh, that can then be run through the algorithm and then uh, assessments from there. So uh, sorry I didn't catch that one earlier, but that was um, one of the questions that had come up uh, in one of the earlier slides. Um, one more, uh, actually a couple more slides here, um, and then we'll um, open it up officially to, to Q&A. Um, the intellectual property landscape is um, uh, absolutely worth understanding and considering here in the um, in, uh, biometric wearable sensor systems. So what you can see here is some data from uh, an organization called IP Watchdog. They, um, they look at uh, the, all kinds of different IP landscapes, in this case, uh, the one related to IoT wearables. And as you can see here, the, the orange is the sensor systems associated with, uh, with wearable devices, and the vast majority of these sensor systems are, uh, or sensor systems IP is related to things like accelerometry, biometric uh, sensor systems, and then also environmental uh, sensor systems um, by and large. Um, so as you can see, it's been one of the biggest growth areas over the course of, say, the last uh, seven or eight years or so in terms of the IP landscape. So there's, um, uh, I would just encourage you to understand um, what that landscape looks like um, as you go through uh, building out the, your biometric wearable. You want to understand um, what that landscape looks like and um, uh, to ensure you don't um, uh, across any of the the, um, the the IP landscape in an unnecessary way, and then um, and then how um, uh, depending on what your device is intended to do and the the end use case, this is um, there's also um, IP considerations um, uh, up the stack as I as I mentioned before in terms of the assessments, the user interface. Despite being a, a relatively young industry in terms of the, the wearables uh, wearable segment as a whole, uh, despite being relatively young, it, uh, there's, uh, there's a fairly extensive uh, IP landscape that, that needs to be considered here. So 
Um, and that really goes up and down the, the layers here in, um, in the biometric sensor systems and also in, uh, in, in wearable devices as a whole. So uh, with that, I believe, and so uh, in summary, we, as you can tell, are strong believers in the, the, the fact that the, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. And all of this needs to be designed and implemented and tested and validated together in, in a way that uh, gets you to a, um, an optimal, um, optimal performance and the best, uh, ultimately the best user experience and, that you can deliver to, uh, to ensure that, that your customers uh, are um, uh, achieving what they want to achieve with these devices. Everyone buys these devices for uh, to achieve uh, some some goal or some objective of some kind, and so um, it, it really uh, it, it starts at the very beginning in the the, the physical and hardware layer and delivering a, a meaningful user experience that actually uh, accomplish enables the user to accomplish those goals. So with that, <clears throat> pardon me, I um, will officially open it up to to Q and A and. Uh, an open discussion here. So if you do have any questions that come through, um, uh, th please submit those through the, the webinar interface and um, I'll take those as they come in. Um, we did get one other question that comes through is um, around, uh, so we've, we've talked about quite a, a bit about the, the upside of uh, using a systems approach like this. Uh, what are the downsides or potential downsides of uh, taking a holistic or, or systems approach like this. Uh, it's a great question. Um, there, um, we, we often get uh, questions um, like, can you just separate, your, separate out your algorithms and I'll do everything else? Or can we just use your mechanical design or your optimal mechanical configuration of, um, uh, of the, the LEDs and the, the photo detector? And our answer is always no, because um, uh, because everything we've just talked about here. But it, it, there um, there are requests, and there are certain um, aspects of the market that want to separate these things out. So there's you do lose um, in some respects uh, some flexibility in terms of the the ability to segment out different parts of the system. Uh, if you have a strong preference or if you already have, let's say, a specific hardware designed in, um, there can be um, uh, changes required in order to utilize a systems approach like this. But uh, on the whole, we find that, that those uh, potential negatives are, are far outweighed by, by the positives of uh, highly accurate biometric sensor systems that feed uh, compelling, meaningful user experiences. So great question. Um, keep them coming. I don't see any other questions coming in at the moment. Um, so if you do have uh, if you do have any questions, um, or if there's anything else that we have covered so far that you'd like me to dive deeper in, please uh, please let me know. I'm happy to do so. Um, otherwise, uh, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time and. Um, don't want to keep you around any longer than we need to. So, um, you know, one other thing I will um, I, I will mention: if you do have questions following the webinar, if, or if any of your colleagues or anyone else has questions, please do feel free to reach out to me. Uh, there's my contact information. I would be happy to talk further about this, answer any questions, cover any other topics that may be of interest to you, and um, would be happy to do that. So. Uh, please do reach out if, you, uh, if you'd like to talk further on this or if you do have questions that you think of afterwards. Uh, but with that, I still don't see any questions coming through uh, the webinar interface. So um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, just once again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today. I hope you found this to be valuable. And um, we will get the slides and the recording out to you soon, and uh, please do share that with anyone you think might be interested. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.